Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and so glad you're with us to stay curious today. It's Friday, February 4th, and we usually have Tales from the White Room with Travis Todd Thompson, but Triple T's a little under the weather. He's fine, but like myself, we got exposed to too much cold Saturday during our astronaut memorial, and I'm just getting over a cold, and poor guy's got the flu. So Triple T will be back with us next week and uh, to tell you some more outstanding tales from his job of putting the astronauts in their in their spaceship during the shuttle era. But today we're going to talk about something dear to Marty Winkle heart, heart, Winkle's heart, my co-producer and cameraman. We are looking at Antares, Lunar Module 8 on the surface of the moon. It'll get there tomorrow at about 4 in the morning, 51 years ago, with astronaut Alan Shepard, the first uh, American to go to space on a suborbital flight in 1961, and Edgar Mitchell, his one and only space flight. And Edgar Mitchell is a great friend of this museum. We'll see a picture of him with our uh, with Charlie Mars, our, our uh, godfather of this museum, here in a few minutes as we talk about the Apollo 14 mission to the moon that, that restored America's confidence in back, going back to the moon and continuing some really wonderful science. This was the last mission that did not have a rover. It was also a mission that, uh, I said, restored the confidence after the near disaster of Apollo 13. Uh, which was in April of 1970. So February 71, things had been checked out. Everything had been fixed. And with a uh, on the command module, they put a redundant system in there from the explosion of that oxygen tank. And they're going to the moon. They had some problems headed towards the moon. First was pulling the lunar module out of the third stage uh, S1, S4B that was headed to the moon when they went to dock with it. They uh, they didn't connect properly, and there was some concern if they, they did it four or five times, and finally it worked. I wish I'd have brought, forgot to bring the command module and lunar module with me on today's show, but we got plenty of pictures. So it was not without some excitement, and even the descent down to the lunar surface was uh, delayed uh, for one orbit as they checked out some uh, uh, switches and stuff that were giving bad signals. Now, this was Marty's job as a Grumman lead technician engineer uh, inside that spacecraft in there. And Marty, you and I didn't talk about that, but you, except that you remember that situation there. And those were the type of bugs you were trying to work out before it launched, correct? Yeah. To find out and make sure everything was talking to each other. There may have been a little solder rolling around in there, they think. So uh, what they did was they patched a, a software patch around this anomaly that was showing up on the orbit that they wanted to land, all right? So they actually landed at, on February 5th at 5 a.m. And just imagine not many people up to see that on a Friday morning to boot. So they started walking at t about 9.30 that morning. We're going to talk a little more about that in a second. Uh, they were the four, fifth and sixth humans to walk on the moon after uh, Apollo 12. Uh, and Pete Conrad, or Pete Conrad was the commander of Apollo 12 with Alan Bean. When Al Shepard stepped on the moon, he said, it's been a long way, but we're here. And that was 9.42 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we'll celebrate, tomorrow is Saturday, so we're celebrating that moment today. But before we get into too much more about Apollo 14 and some of the little things that you don't know about it, I'm sure you know that Alan Shepard hit a golf ball on the moon in not to be outdone, Edgar Mitchell threw one of his uh, poles as a javelin thrower to act like he was an athlete on the moon. The first athletes on the moon. Uh, this is also the longest walk. We, we probably didn't walk uh, physically as far away from the lunar module as these gentlemen did, uh, over a mile away. And they also had a buddy system where they had... Uh, for the first time, Apollo 11 and 12 didn't have it. Of course, 13 would have had this because they're duplicating 13's mission. They had a buddy system hose that if one of them, a personal life support system failed, the other one could plug into his and supply air to that other astronaut. So a lot of thinking went into this mission to make things easier. They had a little rickshaw. They called it the mechanical equipment transport 
a two-wheeled uh, uh, rickshaw that had a camera on it and scientific instruments. But I dug up a couple little interesting birthdays today, and we'll go to the first one, Marty. 120 years ago, I thought it would be interesting to share the birth of Charles Lindbergh. He was born 120 years ago, February 4th, 1902, in Detroit, Michigan, but he was raised in Little Falls, Minnesota, in Washington, D.C. Lucky Lindy, as he became known after his famous solo flight across the Atlantic in 1927, uh, 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 he was... The uh, his father was a well-known uh, congressman, and so he actually grew up in Washington D.C. a lot uh, in his adolescence. He went from an obscure U.S. airmail pilot at age 25 to worldwide fame in claiming a $25,000 prize, the Orteg Prize, 25 grand, Marty, in in 1927 uh, uh, was a pretty big chunk of change. Okay. Uh, he died in August 26, 1974, at age 72, so he witnessed all the Apollo moon landings. We've told you before that um, uh, Scott McLeod, who passed away last year, uh, and the Grumman test uh, astronaut, uh, Scott actually um, took Lindbergh uh, anonymously incognito to the launch of Apollo 8. A lot of the Apollo astronauts, uh, this was their hero. And um, Lindbergh was a complicated man. Of course, he was scarred by the kidnapping of his son at age two, uh, who was murdered in what was called the crime of the century. There he is in an airplane late, later in life. He became very reclusive. Uh, he, but he helped Robert Goddard, one of the few uh, business people and famous people that, that sought money for Robert Goddard, the great rocket scientist, to build his projects in New Mexico in the 1930s. And, of course, he was on a lot of government boards and senior boards in the aerospace industry. But one interesting fact I read uh, that Neil Armstrong ha has written about or is that Arm, uh, Lindbergh gave Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, this piece of advice. Stop signing your autograph out in public. Because once you start signing it, you will never stop. You'll never have a moment's peace. Lindbergh uh, cherished his privacy. And it became known that Armstrong is not going to do signatures, so don't approach him. And it wasn't to be mean or nasty or anything. The guy wanted to be out in public once in a while and not be bothered with that. And uh, we've talked about Armstrong teaching college uh, in the University of Cincinnati and telling his students on the first day of class, don't ask me, yes, I am the first man on the moon, but don't ask me about it. Don't have your parents ask me about it. Don't ask for autographs. You'll flunk my class. And so, uh, and you know, fame has its price and, and probably the biggest thing that you lose in your fame is your privacy. Well, 120 years ago, Lucky Lindy born, and the world is, is so much better for that, and we just thought we'd pass that on because Marty and I love Robert Goddard, and this was really a man that supported Goddard and, and when he didn't have very much support. And if he'd had more support, we're convinced Goddard could have flown something as early as 1940, orbiting the Earth by 1940, and he died in 1945. Well, we have an astronaut birthday, Marty. Today we've got um, uh, tomorrow, actually, on Saturday, February 5th, is Dr. Mary Lewis Cleave shown here in her NASA uh, photo when she was first hired by them in 1980. She flew on STS-61B in 1985 and STS-30 in 1930. I mean, in 1989, she'd fly in 1930. <laughs> Still got a little medicine in me, folks, from that cold. Uh, so she was on some early flights there, the pre-1990 era. Ten days in space, uh, she was involved in the avionics and Capcom on five shuttle flights. Uh, I did not say that she grew up in Southampton, New York. Uh, born in Southampton, grew up in Great Neck, New York. And she was very involved in Texas, uh, uh, Utah, Colorado University. Uh, and there she is on the cover of Texas Monthly. And she still teaches. Well, in this picture, she taught a, a picture of her giving uh, uh, inspiration to 
a class somewhere. So happy 75th birthday to Mary Cleave, born this date in Southampton, New York, February 5th, 1947. Well, let's talk about Apollo 14 and, and some fun things about it here at the museum. All kinds of things cross our, our paths, our desks, and into our world, and we offer things like this on eBay. This is a sticker uh, published by Hall Syndicate, which is Gary Hart, the artist for The Wizard of Id. Still a very popular cartoon. And here the the king is pressing one of the servants, I guess, just to tighten up the screws on everything's got to be right for Apollo 14, Apollo 14 Press. So uh, I'm not sure if that's a press credential gag or something uh, in, in an inside gag for space workers because they would get things printed like this a lot but it's something that uh, i cherish when you run across interesting things like this but what we really want to talk about is the apollo official patch there on the left with shepherd rosa and mitchell and then the beep beep patch of the backup crew of gene cernan ron evans and joe engel now this the way you were chosen as astronauts is if you were a backup on one mission, three missions later you were the prime crew. And that generally held true. Deke Slayton and Alan Shepard chose the crews, and including Alan Shepard choosing himself to be commander of Apollo 14. He was grounded uh, for years of a, a Meneri's disease in his ear. They got corrected by surgery. So this is a gag patch that Cernan basically did as the one of the great gotchas of the Apollo era. Wally Schirra particularly was uh, a, a, an astronaut that loved to, to joke and play jokes on people and, and I gotcha type of thing. Yeah, Marty. Shepard didn't really pick himself for Apollo 14, Apollo 13. Okay. Yes, Marty was, uh, was correct to me there. He did, and it's true, though I'm correct also. He chose himself to be commander of his space flight, which was actually Apollo 13. This was the Apollo 13 crew, Shepard, Rosa, and Mitchell. And Shepard approached Commander Jim Lovell of, of 13 and says, ah, I could use a little more training here. I'm a little rusty. And so let's switch our crews, okay? Now, Marty... And they did. So so uh, Apollo 14 and, and uh, switched with Apollo 13, and the rest is history. They wouldn't have changed vehicles, Marty, wouldn't they? No. No, no. no. So, so, uh, he was, so this crew was actually working with the command module uh, LM-109, I think, or CM-109 and, and uh, Lunar Module 7 that was the 713 uh, Lunar Module. So... Uh, so this was a, a strange thing and in, in, in an anomaly uh, in the progression of, of crews being chosen. Uh, a lot of it is a simple twist of fate, how these astronauts were chosen to be certain missions. Uh, medical issues came up. Some of them had to be pulled for things, just like Schweigert got uh, put in place of Mattingly because Mattingly got measles uh, a, a week before the Apollo 13 launch. So, back to the I gotcha. They love to have fun. They love to poke fun of everybody. They love to uh, uh, joke. They, they had a great time doing it. So, what uh, Cernan came up with was this patch based on the popular Warner Brothers Looney Tunes, Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner animated cartoon. And the patch tells the story of the Roadrunner beating the Coyote to the lunar surface. Okay. And it has their first team uh, on the on the roadrunner there on the moon duplicating the patch uh, the official patch on the left where the astronaut pin is leaving the earth it's the coyote that's leaving the earth well the beep beep are placed across the top of the patch in the the prime crew, the, the backup crew on the bottom well prior to the launch and i'm going to tell you a little more symbolism here prior to the launch the backup crew has final access to both spacecraft. So as they were setting gauges and switches in the command module and packing the lunar module prior to landing, they stashed patches in every nook and cranny, setting up a mini blizzard, they called it, of gotchas for the three rookies. Uh, as Cernan described it in his book, uh, uh, a, a real good book that Cernan wrote about his mission to the moon. And so... Uh, 
they started, uh, so I'm going to describe the patch here. If you look at the Roadrunner, he's got a gray beard to represent the age of, of Alan Shepard's advanced age. He was like 45, I think. Um, he's red because Stu Rosa was red-haired, and he's got a pot belly uh, depicts Edgar Mitchell's exercise regime, it says here, because he was... He, he had a, he was not uh, an, an athletic type uh, Edgar Mitchell, and uh, so uh, they get in the lunar module and during a TV transmission for cameras, Stu Rosa is talking to Fred Hayes of Apollo 13, who was the Capcom at the time, and Stu Rosa says, "Hey Fred, did you hear the last comment I made about how clean the spacecraft was?" And uh, Hayes goes, "Roger, Stu." And then Rosa comes in. That was planned, as you know, for all the uh, authorized people who worked on the spacecraft. We're really inundated with unauthorized objects in both spacecraft. I think Ed was showing uh, you one up there. And then Rosa says, if you can see this, and he holds up a patch on the TV of, of, the, of the beep beep patch, which I have one right here. Um, as you can see, these are everywhere. I don't know if... Any of the backup crew are there tonight, but they've left their calling card. And uh, Fred Hayes knows what's going on, and he replies, Okay, we have a pretty good picture, Stu, and they are here. And Rosa said, Okay, tell them we sure appreciate every compartment that we open having one of these things come floating out. And Fred says they aim to please. And according to Cernan, perhaps the most repeated phrase on the private radio loop was at Shepard's annoyance when still another patch would suddenly appear and Shepard would say, tell Cernan, beep, beep his ass. All right. So this beep, beep uh, Roadrunner patch, and, and uh, move it in on me, Marty. Uh, I'm, I'm holding one there. Uh, this, this patch uh, was the only backup crew patch produced and the only one to fly to the moon and one of the great gotcha gags of the... Uh, the whole thing of the whole of um, the space program. Now, the one I have here was a later replica. The original ones are gold, and you see the silver that I have a picture of. It has a gold outline, and this is silver outline. Uh, was was part of the uh, the deal about them. Where's my little? Uh, so collectors seek these patches, one of the most sought-after patches. Um, oh, I was looking for my little note on the, how the how it was lined up there. Ah, there, there we are. I got it there. Uh, the rare patch used by the backup crew has a gold border. All right, this is silver. So uh, it was made by AB Emblem Corporation, and this was a reprint that they did a couple years later. The silver border souvenir was also produced in limited numbers, and various replicas in the backup patch have been produced over over the years. So, they sell for anywhere from a hundred dollars, and they've even sold as high as six or seven hundred dollars because it was space flown on there. So, a cool part of space history, a cool part for all you people that love patches in there. The beep beep patch of the backup crew for Apollo 13. Yeah, again, it's so cool that they got Wiley Coyote, a beard for Shepard, red for Rosa, and a pot belly there for Mitchell. And the Roadrunner's like, we beat you. Well, here's the full moon, all right, and I'm going to show you where Apollo 14 landed is that red circle. And they landed there because the lunar orbiters, three of them that orbited the moon, uh, taking uh, reconnaissance photographs for the landings, saw that there is a big pile of, of uh, where they landed was a huge uh, 10 square miles of debris that they feel came out from the inside of the moon when that big Marty go above that uh, uh, the, the arrow the, the circle and there's a kind of a circular huge cratered area go to the right there yep up higher there that's that's the crater Copernicus and go above it as is the dark area you see is a giant 700 mile uh, ring. That's Mer Iridium, the sea of, of rain. And a big impact there 
uh, in the er moon's early days of a billion years ago, dug out all kind right there. That whole area right there was impacted and material was dug up from maybe 200 miles below the surface of the moon and flopped. One of the places it flopped was that red circle you see there, Fra Marrow. That's why we went there to find uh, the internal uh, makings of the moon, what the interior mantle was. And there's a lot of house-sized boulders on this place there, too. So they were thinking, Marty's given me a few shout-outs there. Dave Stang uh, has a question. Thank you for watching, Dave, and everybody watching today on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Spotify. Dave's question is, did Shepard ask for a later flight, or was the decision of the crew to go later flight handed down from NASA higher-ups? No, he asked for the later flight. Uh, what? No, NASA. NASA said he needs, he's, needs more additional time for training. That's my well, understanding. Okay. He, that, that, you're, you're all questioning whether uh, NASA made this decision or uh, did Shepard make that decision? Uh, probably, probably combined. I guarantee you Shepard was in on the process there. That they, 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 He had to probably not feel too secure of going there. Yeah, Regardless, the decision was made, and Shepard was involved with making those decisions. So, you know. Uh, but, yeah, NASA higher-ups may have realized, including training people, hey, he's not up to snuff, and reporting back to him, like our good friend that passed away, Bob Pearson, may have noticed that he needed more training at the time. So, uh, so uh, you know, if I insinuate it was it was Shepard's sole decision, no, no, he would have never made that decision on his own. It was a, uh, NASA was a complete team, and they would have evaluated everything about it. It would have been mutual. But it was a big decision to make because uh, uh, the um, – uh, but the mission was the same. They, they were going to the same place, and they just swapped on there. So, And then when Apollo 13 uh, panned out the way it did, had this had Apollo 13 landed at Fra Marrow, of course, Apollo 14 would have gone to another one of the locations that uh, they were going. And it was all about the science, all about uh, uh, trying to learn what the moon is made of. Three theories that it formed by its beside the, 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 the Earth independently, just like we did, was it formed somewhere else and captured by the Earth in its orbit? Or was it ripped out of the Earth by an object that struck the Earth and knocked us on our tilt of 24 and a half degrees? And that is basically what the Apollo science supports, is that this is the outer mantle of the Earth that was ripped away in where like the uh, Pacific Ocean was. But that is not the definitive answer. There are still some anomalies to that uh, that question of how the moon formed. Thank you all for being interested in that. There's the astronauts sitting down. Stu Rose on the left. Al Shepard, America's first astronaut, 15 minutes suborbital flight. And there is Edgar Mitchell. And they have all passed away. Uh, there is the Apollo 14 command module, CM-10, a beautiful display at Cape McKinney Space Center out there at the Saturn V building. I took this picture many years ago. I think they've got a, a different look on it there. And there in the center, folding his fist, that's uh, Edgar Mitchell and Charlie Mars there on the right, who uh, has uh, the museum. This museum has been his baby for over 20 years and he's just stepped down as our chairman of the board, but is still very active in uh, our museum here. There is Antares, is what they named the lunar module number eight. Look at how tilted it is. Yes, it was tilted quite a bit. In fact, this is a very rough area of the moon, not smooth like Tranquility Base or like uh, where Apollo 12 landed. Uh, this is a more, like I said, they know that this material erupted from the impact of that giant uh, sea and material flew a thousand miles and landed here. And this is what they were looking for. Very much like sand. Look at how the pads dug in there. Uh, and this is, it's a loamy feeling much like sand, not like dirt. Uh, and it's been pulverized by micrometeorites.
for billions of years. Look at how that leg, his pad, has dug in there. And the astronaut it actually landed in a crater that, though it looks like that, that uh, you see the engine bell underneath there, that's not all caused by the engine exhaust. You can see a little crater there on the far left in this little crater that it almost set foot in that crater two feet more to the, the side there, Marty. They may have ha uh, had a very serious tilt. And what was the maximum tilt, Marty, that the lunar module could have? I forget. I meant to look it up. I think it's around 15 to 17 degrees uh, for the uh, sense stage to properly lift off. Of course, they would have, they would have no matter what it was, they were going to try it because uh, 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 that's the only way to get back home. Uh, and there's looking out one of the, the triangular windows, and I put that in for Marty because as he worked as a Grumman engineer, he was inside all the ascent uh, stages of the lunar modules and looked out those windows, mostly probably at a wall you were looking at or uh, brick walls there. And just imagine, Marty, that you're looking out that wall, and there, there's the moon surface in there. Um, the astronauts brought back uh, 94 pounds of moon rocks and samples, uh, most samples found that they were to be four to four and a half billion years old, much older than where Apollo 11 and Apollo 12. Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 samples were three uh, to 3.8 billion years old, and these were definitely over four billion years old. So mission accomplished. They did get to where some of this debris had been thrown up uh, in the early days of the moon's violent beginning. Uh, of course, everyone remembers Shepard hitting a golf ball on the moon, two Spalding balls with a McGregor six iron attached on a tool tool shaft, and Mitchell, uh, not to be, uh, Mitchell also performed, without NASA's knowledge, extrasensory perception experiments on the moon with some test subjects back on Earth, and uh, he later formed the Noetic Institute for Paranormal Activities, and he promoted that all his life, the Noetic, N-O-E-T-I-C, Institute is still active in paranormal uh, ufology and uh, extrasensory perception things. Here is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter photograph. Uh, we still have an orbiting spacecraft around the moon taking pictures of the uh, very detailed pictures of things. And here it took... You see the big arrow to the left is the ascent, the, the descent module of Ares, Antares, that was left there. ALSEP means Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Package. And we're going to see pictures of that here in just a minute. They walked, the first excursion was over to deploy the ALSEP, and then they went over to Triplet Crater and then Weird Crater, and then they walked back. The second day, they went out for a four-hour spacewalk, and you can see the arrows show their, their tracks. And they went by Flank Crater, and they were trying to get up to Cone Crater to look inside of it. You can see the footsteps. Yeah, you can see the footsteps there, Marty, indeed. The, 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 because the lunar is like, like snow. It would, you, you're tracked where it's at, but where you made a track, the material, lighter material on top exposed darker material. Get me some rocket fuel there. 200 meters is your scale there, okay? So that's a, you know, that's about 200 meters is about 500 feet. So you can see they only went about 500 feet from the descent module over to put out their science experiments. And they ended up going a little over a half a mile away, it looks like. So, uh but they got so tired and fatigued because the further they went towards Cone Crater up there at the upper right with them boulders in it, the deeper the regolith got. And like trudging through deep snow, they got tired, lifting their legs up. They got very dirty, and they got exhausted. And their time ran up, and they had to come back, and they were about 60 feet from the edge of the rock, uh, that crater to look in it. Here is the ALSEP experiment. Apollo Lunar Science Experiment Project. The rickshaw is in the left foreground there that carried tools there. And there they have a heat experiment. Uh, they ha they're gauging the lunar atmosphere to see if there is any. Uh, there's a heat flow experiment there. And that, the veiny thing is the 
a radioactive uh, generator that uh, supplied power to these experiments. Interestingly, uh, on this mission, they were to take, uh, they had 20 detonation. Uh, the astronauts were to set off 21 small explosions on the surface and arm a mortar to launch four grenades after they left. Scientists hope to gain new information about the shape, structure, thickness of the outer lunar crust from the resulting vibrations. Called the active seismic experiment, it shows might even show that there was ice underneath there. So uh, they actually took pyrotechnics with them on the moon and discharged them. Of the 21 small explosions on the surface, three or four of them didn't detonate. And then they actually used these grenades after they left to detonate uh, larger explosions on the surface. So, Marty, I'm thinking about you and your grummies packing those grenades and explosive in, in there. And, uh, of course, they're, they're probably inert and have to be activated uh, in there. Do you remember anything about that? I'm, Mark, I was listening. I was reading a text oh. from Mark Dusiak. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, I was, I was talking about the pyrotechnics on board there, that they had uh, four grenades and right. and twenty one uh, explosive charges that they 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 put on the surface there. And I'm just saying, uh, was that any special concern uh, packing up the lunar module? They they're probably not activated and had to twist something to detonate them. Uh, to activate them on there, but bet you didn't think about that blowing up things on the moon, so we could see what the uh, what it was like inside the moon there. What's uh, what do you Siak brothers have to say today? There's a question for me: If they touch down deeper in that crater, and the slope angle was too much, would they have relit the descent stage and moved to a flatter spot close by to the surface? Well, it, no. <laughs> Okay. First, the decent stage only designed to, to light one time, and Apollo 13 proved it can light a second time, which is so close to the surface that it could have exploded. That's why they shut down when they get lunar contact. Right. It's six feet from, it's a, a six foot probe at the bottom of the landing gear. There's a micro switch there. So they shut the engine down when it hit that six foot because they don't want that combustion to come back up and possibly cause an explosion. So no, they could not have done it. Then there's so much lunar dust flying, they wouldn't be able to see a flat spot. Yes, good question there. The question was, and you heard some of Marty's answer, I'll just repeat it because you didn't hear it clearly. If they'd landed and they couldn't, at uh, such a steep angle that they couldn't lift off, would they have ignited the second stage, the, the descent stage again to try to hover and move around? And the answer is no. One, it's too close to the surface and they're worried about it, that causing other problems, uh, combustion. Uh, combustion. And then two, uh, though they did learn on Apollo 13 that they could relight the, the descent stage twice, it was never designed to do that, but they had to do that for course corrections, uh, which was an incredible part of Apollo 13, using the descent stage engine. You see the bell of it there. Uh, uh, I think they used it three times, actually, to do course corrections. So, no, they, they could not re relift that and hover it, even if they had enough fuel. It wasn't designed to, to do that. And there would be all kinds of other things to consider, like how deep those that, that uh, uh, pad is in there. Would the pad would it come up directly? But good thoughts, good thoughts there. The fifth thing is, is combustion. Again, mentioned at the six-foot probe. Yes. They shut the engine down when it hit. So yes, they they had us. They had these poles that you see are, are six foot long. That when they touched, a blue contact light came on on the uh, uh, control panel, and then the, the 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 commander was supposed to shut off the engine so it would fall at six feet. The shock absorbers in the legs were designed to be crushed a little bit. And Neil Armstrong did not do that when he landed. He didn't turn the engine off until they had all three pads, all four pads on the ground. And uh, therefore, that's why they had to jump up to the ladder. The ladder was kind of tall when he jumped down. It, then they'd practice because they'd practice with the, the uh, shock absorbers crushing in there. But good questions. Glad that people are interested in our uh, 51 years ago, these pictures were made. Now, what this is a picture of is one of three 
uh, laser reflector panels about uh, three feet across that were put on the moon by the astronauts. And uh, I've said before, there's a Big Bang Theory comedy sitcom episode where they are on top of their apartment complex in Pasadena and bounce uh, light off a laser through a telescope onto one of these and back to Earth, and uh, which takes a half a second there and a half second back. And they got a, a reading that they had sent a laser bounced off the moon there. Marty's going to circle the... Uh, little leveler just like you you have on on a lot of uh, uh, instruments and tools in your own work workbench that is the little bubble level that they did to level it up there and of course then they were told what direction to point it towards the earth uh on there so very interesting that we have four of these on the moon and it can be a science project for you to bounce a uh, laser off of that here is Edgar Mitchell. I know that's Edgar because he doesn't have stripes on his uniform. That was an innovation from Apollo 11 and 12, was though Neil Armstrong had the camera all the time on Apollo 11, except for a brief time when he gave it to Buzz. Uh, and then Buzz didn't take any real good pictures of Neil. Uh, but uh, there's one or two of, of Neil on the moon that Buzz took. But uh, so... And then Apollo 12, they both had cameras, and they had to ask, was that you, Al, or is that you, Pete? And so they solved that problem and still do on spacewalks by putting stripes around the legs, arms, and a stripe down the hood uh, helmet. He is, uh, he's got a tether here. He's pulling something out of the lunar module with uh, some tethers there that, remember, it's one-six gravity, so things don't have to be as thick as they as, as you think they would. And, uh, and these type of tethers were easily stowed on the way back from the moon in a bag, and then they bring them back and cut them up, and NASA gives uh, gave these out to people uh, to reward them for helping with the lunar module. There is a very famous picture uh, of this mission, one of the most uh, frequently seen ones of Commander Alan Shepard on the moon there, and, uh, uh, you know, really cool that, that he got to do that. If you look at the lunar helmet there, you got some visors on there. You got some improvements over the last, uh, the, the first two missions where the astronauts said it was so bright. I mean, just imagine being on a beach uh, all, you know, your whole trip, uh, excursion out there. It was so super bright. Back up. Yeah. Oh, uh, the dirt on his boots on the bottom there. Thank you for pointing that out, Marty. Look at how the, the lunar dust is clinging to everything. All right. And that was, it's like a static electricity almost clinging to things. Uh, and uh, so this is a problem going back to the moon is the dust is very uh, tiny. It's finer than talcum powder. It's going to get into everything. And all the astronauts say that the moon smells like what kind of cheese? Glimberger cheese, Swiss cheese, ha, ha, ha. No, it doesn't smell like cheese. It smells like gunpowder or a burnt fireplace. It has this impact uh, uh, ignition type of smell from like a gunpowder. Not, not exactly sulfur, but a smell that something had been detonated. And that makes sense with all the violence everywhere. Every crater is an impact from something hitting the moon going 20,000 miles an hour and making its mark. Here is that rickshaw again that they used. And uh, you don't see this picture very much. And I pulled these pictures off the Flickr Apollo archives. And you can retouch these up all you want. These are raw uh, scanned Hasselblad film that uh, Jet Propulsion, that the Johnson Space Center scanned all these high res images. And Flickr is the warehouse form. And they're yours to look at and do with what you want. So, uh, 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 and have some fun with them there, okay? Hey, we've got Carlton Bailey on there. Hi, Carlton. We can't wait to for you all to meet Carlton and his excellent uh, launch photography. He's uh, done more than 600 uh, unmanned launches. Uh, we got Christopher Mick says it's the home of the hot air affair this weekend. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Professor Sewell, Keith Sewell, glad that you're watching us today. Pam Shivik. 
Uh, we've got a uh, Marty Wepko. We've got, it looks like a, a Russian on here. Yeah. Avek Popko, Wepko, Avek Popko, okay. Mark and Tom Usiak, thank you all for watching. Uh, Carolyn Hug, hello, Carolyn, Carolina Hug in there. And uh, Larry Trichinal, yeah, Larry, thank you. We, we've, uh, we know that you've stayed curious before. Terry Trichinal. And I'm horrible at pronouncing names, Humberto Villada Lopez. But uh, glad that you all are watching today and staying curious Turn with us. Turn it over one more. Yeah, yeah, I got that. That that the uh, Larry Trichinal is on the back there. Yeah, thank you, Marty, for bringing those up here. We got Trekkie Techie Jessica Galloway. Uh, she's on standby now if we ever need her help, and usually we do. Uh, but uh, thank you, Jessica, for uh, teaching us how to do this Streamlabs. Here's another beautiful panorama where they combine three or four frames. Shepard is carrying a core tube back to the Met. What's a core tube? Well, they actually took a tube, hollow tube, pounded it down into the, the, the dirt, uh, lunar dirt, as far as they could go with a hammer, and then pulled it out. That gives you a geologic history of the layering of things that happen in ecological time and gives a great insight to the sun's activity by certain isotopes and so forth they see on those different layers and what else do i have there and we're back to the old lucky lindy there so well glad that we could share with you the landing of apollo 14 which happened saturday february 5th at 5 a.m in the morning it was a friday morning february 5th uh, they had some, uh, uh, NASA does not schedule these events for prime time, and all it takes is one or two little events in the timeline for things to get disrupted, and they had those, so their timeline did get thrown off a little bit, which also messed up the ESP experiments that Edgar Mitchell was going to do, because had his timeline gone the way it was supposed to, with not several hours, he couldn't call up, he was doing a secret experiment that NASA didn't know anything about, so he was hoping his buddies back on Earth were paying attention to where they were at in the timeline because uh, he had no way of communicating to him and saying, okay, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm thinking of what letter am I thinking of, <laughs> Marty? That's, they had experiments like that they were trying to do, that he was looking at decks of cards trying to visualize what he was looking and people on Earth were trying to catch what he was looking at. Edgar Mitchell, a very, very interesting gentleman. Uh, he helped this uh, museum uh, build Space View Park with the city of Titusville. Uh, and uh, uh, all these astronauts are now uh, have, have passed on. But their memory lives on, and, and we enjoy sharing all of the, the lunar flights in detail. After all, only six lunar landings, and we can't wait to go back to the moon. One thing I do like emphasizing, Marty, is the Twitter of the day was am radio all right and we did not visually see any of these landings of the apollo era we heard them on the radio we heard them on tv through radio broadcasts there was no live images of them landing it was film all right there was no digital stuff going on it was all film and the film had to be developed and then printed and so it was days after these apollo command module landed that we would finally see the pictures uh, of the the missions and the best place to see those pictures were going to be life magazine that had a contract with all the astronauts in mercury and gemini days uh, and your uh, life and look magazines and then your weekly newsweek and time in u.s news and world report the the weekly uh recap of the the, the news and then the science journals that came out months later. So not easy to find some of these pictures. And one of them, I remember subscribing to Sky and Telescope magazine, which is still a very popular astronomy magazine. And that would be one of the best sources where you'd see glossy pictures of the moon mission uh, uh, two months after they came back in the case of Sky and Telescope. But those were some of the best quality pictures. Today, I'm perusing all of the pictures from the Apollo era on the Flickr Apollo archive and enjoying looking at the raw pictures just are scanned right off the negatives. And uh, 
particularly to you photographers out there, this mission does not have that many spectacular photos, okay? They don't have, there's no mountains in the area to make it look dramatic, like 15, 16, and 17 coming up. And the, as the astronauts obviously didn't spend a lot of time learning composition and so forth in exposures because these had to be no automatic exposure. They had to set the shutter speed and the focal f-stop on the lens. And a lot of those were preset, but with those big gloves, they had to learn how to move some of them around and change lenses on these Hasselblad cameras that were at the time the best. And they're laying on the moon right next to the legs of those um, uh, the, the lunar module there, Marty. We're looking at quad uh, uh, two, aren't we? We're on the left side, two and three. It's between one and two. That's why it's, it's slid to the left or slid to the right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're looking. At, so to the right is where the, the landing legs would have been that they came down on that. So anyway, we love that everyone's staying curious with us. Uh, sorry that you missed Triple T today. I had to scramble to put a little more together uh for our program today and we will be back with you next week as usual to talk about space history astronaut birthdays and things that you want to talk about make a suggestion we read every comment made and take it to heart and i appreciate everybody chiming in today and enjoying our program marty we have anything else um anyway carlton bailey said uh, finishing up the fresh drive to drop for for you to look at and see what you want to talk about. Good. Carlton Bailey, thank you very much. He's putting together, we've inspired him to get his greatest hits of his rockets together. And there, I have, when I first came here and started dealing with our archives, Marty, there's a photo of a Atlas rocket, I think, going in front of the moon, going in front of the almost full moon. And I've marveled at that picture many times, and Carlton took that photograph and gave me a copy of it, and uh, uh, those were pictures that, that were hard to figure out. You didn't have the age that you do today with apps and so forth where photographers can figure out exactly where to be to get that shot again. So uh, really a great photographer, and I can't wait to see some of his stuff and talk to him about going out there. And Carlton Bailey also was a one-hour photo lab technician at Cocoa Beach, where when the astronauts came with their families, he got to see their family uh, pictures. And uh, he'll, he, he'll love telling you about those stories, where he went to some shuttle launches and the family's coming to pick up the pictures from the beach and stuff, and the wife, the wife gets some, and he says, here's some of the pictures of your husband's launch. He's up in space now. So uh, these are the kind of people that we'd love to attract to stay curious in the American Space Museum. We love you all for watching us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Spotify. And Apple and Google will have audio podcasts on there. These are important to the future of our museum that we reach out and let people know that, that we are, are trying to preserve the birth of the American Space Age yeah. right here where it all began in Brevard County, Florida. So... Marty, thank you for all that you do. We're going to catch up. We've had a couple, two or three weeks here of just, oh, working hard for all the events that were happening with the Astronaut Memorial and the Apollo 13 event. And uh, we're happy to have them behind them. And and uh, not to make you all jealous, but we might get out on the golf course here this weekend, Marty, while uh, some of you out there are uh, uh, de-icing your windshields. <laughs> okay, so sorry to rub it in, but hey, uh, we're blessed uh, to to be part of this museum and living here in Florida. So, well, on behalf of our wonderful nonprofit and our whole staff here, led by our wonderful uh, leader Karen Conklin, I'm Mark Marquette, and we will see you next week to bridge the space between us.